The Great Fire of London. Chapter One. It is the year sixteen sixty six. London is an old city, with lots of narrow streets. A lot of people are ill because there are rats in all the streets and the houses. One evening, a baker, Thomas Farriner, and his daughter, Harriet, are making bread. It is late. We must work quickly, says Thomas. We need this bread for the king in the morning. Just then, Mary, the baker's maid, comes in. You're late, Mary, says Thomas. Sorry, Mr. Farriner, says Mary. Thomas, Harriet, and Mary. Make bread for two hours. Then, Mr. Farriner's wife, Anne, calls down to them. Time for bed, girls. She says. We're just finishing. Says Harriet. Harriet and Mary go up to bed. Thomas. Takes the bread from the oven. Good, the fire is nearly out now, thinks Thomas. Thomas calls Anne. What are you doing? It's very late. Thomas goes up to bed. But he doesn't close the oven door. An hour later, the baker's shop is on fire. Wake up, girls! Wake up! cries Anne. The house is on fire. Quick, open the window. Says Thomas, "Let's go up on the roof." Thomas jumps to the house next door. Anne and Harriet follow him, but Mary stays on the roof of the baker's shop. Jump over, over here! here! They all cry. Jump! Jump! I can't," says Mary. "I'm afraid." Chapter Two. People come out of their houses. They all look up at Mary. Jump now! They cry. I can't. Says Mary. Please help me. I'm going back. Says Thomas. We can't leave her. Wait here. Don't go, Thomas. Cries Anne. Now this house is on fire too. Just then, someone brings a ladder. Thomas, Anne, and Harriet quickly climb down. Ten minutes later. Oh, mother! Says Harriet. Cry, my love," says her mother. 
Look at our shop, our things, our home, says Thomas. We have nothing. What can we do now? There is a strong wind and the fire spreads quickly to more houses in Pudding Lane. Where are the firefighters? Everybody asks. Just then, 20 firefighters arrive. They begin to put water on the fire. Bring more water! They cry. We need more water now! But the fire is out of control and soon all the houses in Pudding Lane are on fire. The people in the street begin to ask, Where is the Lord Mayor of London? He's asleep in bed says an old man. We want the Lord Mayor! cry the people. Go and find the Lord Mayor. He lives in Maiden Lane, says the chief firefighter to a boy. He must come quickly. What can we do? asks Anne. We can't stay here. Let's go down to the River Thames, cries Thomas. Follow me! Chapter 3 In a different part of London, Samuel Pepys is asleep in his bed. Pepys works for the government. At home, he writes a diary every day. Pepys has a maid called Jane. At three o'clock in the morning, she comes to his room. Wake up, sir! She says. There's a fire in the city! Pepys goes to the window and looks out across London. It isn't a big fire, he says to Jane. I'm going back to bed. Good night. An hour later, Jane comes back. Sir, there are more than three hundred houses on fire. She cries. Peeps jumps out of bed. He quickly puts on his clothes. I must go to the Tower of London, says Pepys. I can see everything from there. Near the Tower, Pepys meets his good friend, Richard Moore. What's happening? asks Pepys. It's very bad news, says Moore. There's a big fire down near the river. Everybody says it's out of control. They climb up the hill to the tower. It is now six o'clock in the morning. Big Clouds of smoke are beginning to spread across London. Bells are ringing from every church in the city. 
Listen to those bells, says Moore. And look, some of the houses near London Bridge are now on fire. Let's run down to the River Thames, cries Peeps. Perhaps we can help the people there. Chapter 4 Peeps and Moore arrive at the river. Crowds of people are running down to the river bank. The fire is now in the next street. Families leave their houses with their hands full. They are carrying their things away from the fire. Everybody wants a boat on the river. Over here! cries a young man to the people in the boats. I'm first, says an old woman. Three people climb quickly into one of the boats. It is the Fariner family from Pudding Lane. It's Thomas Fariner from Pudding Lane, cries a man in the crowd. Tell us about the fire in your baker's shop. Thomas is frightened. I... I'm not a baker, he says. I have a flower shop in Cat Street. The Fariner family leave quickly and go down the river in the boat. Peeps and Moore walk nearer to the fire. There are clouds of smoke and thousands of rats are in the streets. They are running from the burning houses. Just then, they meet 20 firefighters outside a burning building. They are putting water on the fire, but it is spreading quickly. Can you stop the fire? Peeps asks the chief firefighter. It's no good, he answers. There's nothing we can do. But you must blow up the buildings in front of the fire, says Peeps. Then it can't spread to different parts of the city. But we need to ask Thomas Bloodworth, the Lord Mayor, says the chief firefighter. Where is he? asks Peeps. Nobody knows, he answers. What can we do? shouts Moore. We must speak to the king, says Peeps. Come on, let's find a boat. We can go up the river to Whitehall Palace. Perhaps we can speak to the king there. Peeps and Moore go quickly up the River Thames. It is 11 o'clock in the morning, but the sky is black with clouds of smoke. The wind is stronger, and many streets are now on fire. The houses on London Bridge are burning fast, and people are jumping into the river. Chapter 5 They arrive 
at the Palace of Whitehall. We're here to see the king, says Peeps at the front door. What's your name? asks the guard. Samuel Peeps. Wait here, sir, says the guard. A crowd of men is standing outside the door. They are all talking excitedly. We must wait for rain, says one old man. No, we must bring more water from the river, says a young man. But we need more firefighters to do that. Cries a third man. What do you two think? The young man calls to Peeps and Moore. Peeps walks over to the crowd of men. There is only one solution, he says. We must blow up the buildings in front of the fire. Suddenly. Everybody goes quiet. Blow up the buildings in front of the fire, says the young man. He is surprised. Yes, that's right, says Peeps. Just then, the guard cries, "The king wants to see Samuel Peeps." Now, Peeps is surprised. Peeps goes into the king's room. Your Majesty, this is Samuel Peeps, says the guard. Good morning, Mister Peeps, says the king. I hear you have news about the fire. Is this true? Yes, Your Majesty," says Peeps. "The fire is now out of control, Your Majesty," says Peeps. "We must do something very quickly." But what? asks the King. The firefighters must blow up the houses in front of the fire," says Peeps. "Yes," cries the king. "That's the solution. We must blow up the houses. Then the fire can't spread." The king writes a letter. Give this letter to Thomas Bloodworth, the Lord Mayor. He says. Nobody can find him, says Peeps. You must find him, says the King. Take one of my coaches. Go quickly back to the fire. And find the Lord Mayor," says the King. Peeps and Moore go outside at once, and jump into the King's coach. <laughs> Peeps is carrying the King's letter. They drive madly through the narrow streets. Faster! Faster! Calls Peeps to the coach driver. <laughs> Chapter six. In the end, Peeps finds the Lord Mayor. Ah. Here you are," Peeps cries angrily. "Everybody is looking for you." "Hello, Peeps," says the Lord Mayor. 
I'm very tired. I must sit down. Here is a letter from the king, says Peeps. You must blow up the buildings in front of the fire. I know, says the Lord Mayor. I want to pull down houses near the fire, but nobody listens to me. People don't want to lose their homes. Just then, some of the king's soldiers arrive. Lord Mayor, we are here to blow up houses," says one of the soldiers. "Yes," says the Lord Mayor. "Good luck. I'm going home now. I'm tired and dirty, and I want to change my clothes." But, Lord Mayor, wait! Call the soldiers. Goodbye, says the Lord Mayor. The men blow up some houses, but they are very near to the fire. It's no good, says Peeps. To the soldiers, you must blow up buildings one street away from the fire. The soldiers pull down houses and blow up shops. It is now nine o'clock on Sunday evening. Peeps and Moore go home. For three more days, the great fire of London burns. Frightened people and hungry rats run madly through the streets. The fire spreads. To the most important houses and churches in the city, Old Saint Paul's Cathedral burns day and night. Day after day, the firefighters and soldiers work to stop the fire. On the fourth day, the wind. Changes direction, and the fire slowly stops. The firefighters stand and watch for the first time in days. Many people come back to look for their houses and shops, but they find nothing. At home, Peeps. Begins to write about the fire in his diary. He knows the government must work a lot to help the people of London. Five days later, Peeps and Moore climb up the tower of the last church in the centre of London. They look over the city. What a black day," says Peeps. Over thirteen thousand houses, ninety churches, and now there is nothing. Don't feel bad about that," says Moore. Instead, let's remember something important. Only nine people are dead. Fifty years later, London is a very different city. There are no more old, narrow streets in the city centre, but beautiful, wide streets instead. And a new Saint Paul's Cathedral 
stands not far from the banks of the River Thames. But the most important thing is there are no more rats. The Emperor's New Clothes The Emperor has to be told, cried the Chancellor. There's no money left in the Exchequer. He spent it all on clothes. But the soldier at the door of the Emperor's bedroom would not let the Chancellor in. I'm sorry, Your Worship, but the Emperor's in his wardrobe again, choosing something to wear. You can't go in. Then the door burst open, and the Emperor appeared, followed by the Prime Minister. I tell you, I can't see anyone today. I haven't got a thing to wear. Oh, Chancellor, there you are. Put the taxes up another ten percent. I must have another suit. But you already have so many clothes, Your Majesty, and I can't raise income tax again. The people can't pay any more money. I don't care, said the Emperor. I want another one. I'm the Emperor. I can have what I want. Nobody could argue with that. So... When two foreigners arrived that day at the palace gates, saying they were tailors, they were allowed to see the emperor. The tailors said that they made the finest clothes from the most gorgeous and delicate cloth in the whole world. Where is this cloth? Let me see it. I want to see it, the emperor demanded. No, we haven't woven it yet, said one of the tailors. You supply the materials, a loom, a large, bright room, and we'll get weaving. We only supply the skill and, of course, the magic. Magic? Magic? What magic? said the excited emperor. No one mean or stupid... No one unfit for their job, no one unworthy of their place in the royal household will be able to see the cloth we weave. Really? cried the emperor. Amazing, wonderful, begin right away. I'll wear them tomorrow for the big parade through the city. Chancellor, give these men everything they need. And he strode back upstairs to his dressing room. The tailors were taken to a big, comfortable room in the palace and left to start work on the large loom. But all they did was sit down and put their feet up on the royal chairs. And when the materials were brought, silk and mohair and pearls and cloth of gold, they hid them out of sight. The emperor sat in his throne room thinking about the wonderful cloth being woven downstairs. Suddenly, he grinned wickedly. I'll use this chance to find out if any of my ministers are mean or stupid or unfit for their jobs. And so he sent for the Chancellor. Ask how soon it'll be ready, then come back and tell me how it looks. Of course, you may not see anything at all. So the Chancellor knocked on the sewing room door and one of the tailors opened it. Oh, come in, Chancellor, come in. Uh, as you can see, it's almost finished. In the centre of the room stood the big weaving loom, completely empty. The Chancellor just stared at it. What? he thought. Am I stupid? Or mean? Am I unfit for my job? I can't see anything. This is dreadful. Yes, it's very nice, lovely, he mumbled. Mm, yes, I like the pattern. Oh, I can see you have good taste, said one of the tailors. Tell the emperor his clothes will be ready early tomorrow, but we need some cloth of gold. So the chancellor went back to the emperor, trembling and close to tears. Well, well, how does it look? Oh, superb, sire. I've never seen anything quite like it. 
The Emperor rubbed his hands gleefully at the thought of his lovely new clothes and told himself that he'd been right to appoint the Chancellor. Good man, good man. Now, send the Archbishop along to have a look at my new clothes. The Archbishop was sent in to see the magic cloth on its loom. After him, it was the Prime Minister and then the Commander-in-Chief of the Army. They all stared at the empty loom and thought how dreadful it was not to see any beautiful cloth. Mm, am I mean? thought the Archbishop. Am I stupid? thought the Prime Minister. Am I the wrong man to be in charge of the army? thought the Commander-in-Chief. And to hide their doubts, they all threw up their hands and admired the cloth. I particularly like the fringe, said the Archbishop. What unusual colours, said the Prime Minister. Yes, excellent, first class, said the Commander-in-Chief. They all trooped upstairs to tell the Emperor how wonderful the cloth was, and then the Emperor went down to be fitted for his new clothes. But as he entered the room, he was suddenly gripped by fear. Oh, my goodness! I can't see a stitch of cloth. Am I more mean or stupid than all my ministers put together? Or am I not fit to be emperor? Nobody must know I can't see the magic cloth. Uh, what did you think of it, your majesty? asked the tailors, busily unrolling tape measures. Oh, splendid! Yes, quite splendid, he stuttered unhappily. And they pretended to measure the emperor undressing him right down to his underwear and fitting the loose cloth. He stood royally in front of the mirror. Well, they think I'm dressed, he thought, so I must be. Feel the quality, said one tailor. It's all fully lined, you know, said the other. We'll work all night to make them a perfect fit. The two tailors did nothing, of course. They just slept. <coughs> on the next morning, the Emperor walked to their room to put on his new clothes. While his courtiers stood around and clapped, he went through all the actions of getting dressed. You look magnificent, Your Majesty, said the Chancellor, anxious to keep his job. Mm, very regal, I must say, said the Archbishop. The people will love it, said the Prime Minister. The, the buckles are pretty, said the Commander-in-Chief. News of the Emperor's magic clothes had spread through the whole city. Crowds were forming outside the palace, and the streets were lined with people waiting to see the Emperor in all his splendour. Children sat astride their father's shoulders with flags in their hands. Everybody had turned out to see the Emperor's new clothes. Slowly, solemnly, behind the royal banner and a band of trumpeters, the Emperor's procession set out through the streets. Everyone had heard how the magic cloth could not be seen by anyone mean or stupid or unworthy of their job. And nobody wanted to admit to being that. Hooray! Hooray! shouted the crowd. But there were many unhappy faces as people decided they must be more mean or stupid than everyone else. You can see them, can you? Well, of course I can see them. Do you think I'm stupid? Meanwhile, back at the palace, the two crafty tailors packed up their store of rich materials and sneaked out of the city as fast as horses would take them. Bowing to right and left, the Emperor wished that the magic cloth was not so beautifully light. He was bitterly cold. And he wished that the magic boots were not so wonderfully thin. The stones in the road were hurting his feet. Look, look, said a father to his little boy. The Emperor's coming. Which one is he, Daddy? The one in the wonderful clothes. But he isn't wearing anything, Daddy. Look, he's shivering. Why isn't he wearing any clothes? People nearby in the crowd stared at the little boy. I'm sorry, he's too young to know any better, the child's father apologised. He's too young to be fooled, you mean, said his mother. 
the Emperor stark naked. Someone is making a fool of the Emperor and of us. One by one, the crowd realised that the person to either side could no more see the new clothes than they could. Can you see them? Of course I can't. Do you think I'm stupid? The Emperor's stark naked, they shouted. The Emperor's dressed in nothing at all. The Emperor blushed with embarrassment. He had been fooled by the tailors and now here he was, parading in front of all the people without a stitch of clothing. The poor Emperor turned and fled back to the palace. And never again did he waste money on new clothes. <laughs>